normally you can't see my mic so much because I wear black, but it's really noticeable on this light pink t-shirt. What's up everyone? My name is Kelsey. Welcome back to my channel. Today is my March wrap up. So all the books I read in March, I read, ah, shit, God, I suck at preparing for these things. Let me get to my totals page. March. I read nine books, a total of 2,281 pages. Wow, that's the most pages I've read so far this year. Uh, 11 hours listened, average rating of, I don't know, because there are too many decimals. How do I change that? 3.6, one contemporary, two dystopian, three fantasy, two sci-fi, one thriller, one audiobook, two ebooks, six physical books, four adult, and five YA. I have a uh, I'm gonna try and get through some of these quickly because a few other ones I have like a lot of thoughts on and I know they're gonna take me a while to talk about. So we're just gonna get into it. I have, it is, we're in the midst of self isolation right now. So I have a Zoom family chat planned in like 45 minutes. Can I film this in 45 minutes? We'll see. So my first book of the month was The Stars and the Blackness Between Them by Hanada Petrus. This is, I got this at the library, clearly. It's a young adult contemporary. It follows Mabel, who is a teen girl living in the U.S. and is dealing with a recent illness. And then we also follow Audrey, who is from Trinidad. And her mom catches her with a girl and sends her to live with her father in the U.S. to fix her, I guess. And these two meet and sort of develop a friendship and relationship from there. So pros for this book, there are some really great, like really quiet moments between, uh, I feel like this book really shines in the one-on-one -on -one interactions. So there are some times in the garden, Mabel's family has a garden, and when she's there interacting with like her father or with Audrey, it is, they're just very sweet and they feel emotionally deep. There are some really interesting aspects of like the power of ancestry and following multiple generations in one story. We hear perspectives from Audrey's grandmother through Mabel's dreams. So there's definitely some like a bit of magic in this book, but it's not, it's not magical if that makes sense. So my cons for this book are there's kind of a nitpick which is that multiple punctuation which really bothers me in a narrative style. Like there'll be two or three exclamation points. You don't need multiple exclamation, exclamation points in a, in a book. One is an exclamation, that's all you need. There was a lot about astrology, which I really had no idea about going into this, but it's a pretty big focus of the story. It's something Mabel gets into during her like uh, healing process. And I didn't care to read about any of it. I thought that was a bit boring. And I absolutely hated the end of this book. Like it made me angry. <laughs> like I was getting towards the end and I was like, wow, this is like a really interesting story. It was bordering on like three and a half or four stars. And then the last five pages, I was like, what the fuck? And a lot of people loved it. So maybe it's just a me thing, but it went from a three and a half or four to two and a half. <laughs> so I ended up giving this two and a half stars. I can't say it's bad, but it was definitely just not for me. Book two was Fragile Remedy by Maria Ingrande Mora. I read this as an ARC, and this is kind of a bummer because the publication date was actually pushed back, I think, until March of next year, so that sucks. I read the book really early. Um, it's a young adult dystopian. I read it as an ebook, and it's set in a dystopian future in a city where where a disease has kind of crippled the population. It was a, they call it lung rot in the book, and anyone that had symptoms of lung rot was quarantined from the city and is now in a rundown, poverty-stricken area. Because of this disease, new technology was developed and basically scientists grew humans to make replacement body parts for the wealthy residents of the city. And we follow Nate, who is one of these. They're called GEMS, Genetically Engineered Medical Surrogate. So Nate was smuggled to this quarantine part of the city when he was a child, and now that he's a teenager, he needs this uh, special serum in order to survive, and his supplier of this medicine is running out, and he has to figure out how to get the supply and survive without exposing himself as what he is. 
We also follow a whole group of characters, but we only read from Nate's perspective. There's also Reed, Pixel, Alden, Sparks, and Brick, and there's definitely found family situation in this book, and the characters are part of a gang, like a gang that supports each other and helps one another survive. They all have special skills. The best part of this book is definitely the characters, so, and the way they relate to each other. Nate um, cares strongly about everyone in his group, but he has a special connection with Pixel, who is a young girl. I can't remember her exact age, but she reads between like six and nine, um, who they, they both have like an affinity for technology, so they're tinkers where they fix mechanical things. Um, he also has romantic feelings for another guy in their group whose name is Reed, but he tries to ignore them. He thinks it would complicate things and he feels like he doesn't deserve Reed's affections because he's lying to him. There's also Sparks and Brick who have like their own special workings within the group, but this book is also like casually queer because Nate and Reed, uh, that's like the, there's a burgeoning male-male relationship there. Um, it's not stated on page, but while I was reading the book, I got the feeling that Nate was gay and Reed was bisexual, but that's just a guess. It didn't actually say that. Uh, also, Sparks in the group is trans, and it's casually mentioned once. And Alden, um, another character, is coded queer, but again, not explicitly stated. There are some really heavy themes in this book. Uh, I wrote a few down here. It heavily discusses poverty because this area of the city is very run down. They struggle for food and shelter. Also addiction. There's an addictive substance run through this city. And the author does some interesting things like drawing parallels between our real world and how sometimes drugs are almost a way to control <laughs> populations. Um, it also discusses the link between poverty and addiction. It talks about economic barriers to healthcare. It talks about the ethics of cloning. So there are some heavy topics in this book, but it's also very hopeful. Uh, my only con for this book is that the conflict between Gatho City, which is the main city, and the Withers, which is the poverty area, um, it was kind of disconnected and it didn't really explore the connection between the two and like the conflict between the two. So almost the dystopian aspects of the story weren't that strong. There are some content warnings for this book, so I'm gonna put those in the description, but one of them is major character death, so be aware of that. I ended up going at four stars. I really enjoyed it. I would recommend it, and I'm pretty sad that the publication was pushed back like an entire year. Okay, book three. Another one I have thoughts on. Dassel by K.M. Sparza. Oh, Spara. K.M. Spara. This is an adult speculative fiction. How to summarize this book. So this book follows Elisha, who is a man living in poverty. There are generations of debt in his family, and in order to avoid all this debt going to his youngest sister, he takes on his mother's debt and seeks out a contract to be a docile, and docils are basically servants for rich people. So in exchange for paying off all his debt, Elisha becomes a docile for Alex. And Alex is a trillionaire whose family developed the drug docilline, and Dossaline is a drug that docils take in order to be sort of disconnected from their circumstances and very agreeable to everything that they're told to do. This book has like serious content warnings. Uh, the publishers are pretty clear about that in the promotion for the book. So there's content warnings for rape and coercion. Um, the books are super, the book is super explicit. Uh, there's also bits of suicide and like suicidal ideation. So this isn't really a pro or a con, it's just a comment, but this is like, this book is like a weird combination of <laughs> social critique and escapism in the form of romance. Like I said, the sex is super explicit. I personally don't think it was romanticized, but some people disagree with me according to reviews. So my pros for this book are that it was super compelling and like compulsively readable. I read it in less than 24 hours. I stayed up way, way too late. <laughs> I think I stayed up till like 3.30 in the morning reading this. The premise feels like scarily probable and there are some great moments that really struck me about the importance of the importance of language and word choice. Uh, I wrote one down, let's see. Oh, so one of the aspects of this book is dossels have the right to turn down dossaline. Uh, their purchasers can't make them take it and Elisha turns it down. And there's this part in the book where Alex says that Elisha has refused Dossaline and Elisha corrects him in his mind saying that he declined Dossaline. And I really liked that moment because it really brings that language point home. I really, 
really hated Alex. I'm calling that a pro because you're supposed to hate him. The character was perfectly written. He is entitled. He is blind to his faults and blind to the problems that this, his, his company and this system has created. He clearly looks at everything through the lens of his pr privilege and has distorted views of his own generosity. There are multiple times in this book where Alex thinks to himself, look at everything I've done for these people, like letting people suffer in their debt or literally sell themselves to pay off their debt is some kind of favor, which is disgusting. He reasons away all of his terrible actions and like it's such a real it's so realistic. I also really loved the way this book explores the difference between goodness and niceness because Alex is inarguably a nice person. He's kind to his doorman. He tips his drivers. He he's polite and respectful to everyone he meets, but he is not a good person. <laughs> like I'm sure <laughs> there like I'm there are no good people with a trillion dollars. It's just, it's, that's an unconscionable amount of money to hoard. And I just really love how this book handled that. Like, I'm sure, <laughs> I'm sure billionaires are perfectly nice to everyone they meet. I don't think Jeff Bezos would be a dick to me if I met him in real life, but that doesn't make him a good person. <laughs> I also loved Elisha as a character and the way his story progresses is again, super realistic and felt really genuine and was also heartbreaking. So my cons for this book are that it really lulls in the second half story-wise and it gets a bit repetitive in the second half. I definitely think this book did not have to be um, almost 500 pages. There was definitely some emotional distance in the way he the way Elisha interacted with his family. One of my biggest problems is that the world building is very insular. Like, we're in this one city, there's no way to tell a timeline from, like, our present day into the future. Like, I don't know how far in the future this takes place. And there's very little reference to outside of this city. There's some general references to other countries and Alex and his company wanting to expand to other cities, but that's pretty much it. And for a book that, that calls itself speculative fiction or a science fiction parable, I expect more from world building. And lastly, my biggest problem about this book, and I'm going to link some other reviews in the description because obviously I'm super white and I don't have a direct perspective on this, but there is no nuance to race in this book. It doesn't discuss it at all. There are black characters in this book, but slavery is just a fact. It's a thing that happened in the US and for something like this, which is basically debt slavery, that is definitely a topic that would come up at some points, and it's just not in this book at all. Again, this is meant to be speculative fiction, a science fiction parable, so there should definitely be references to real things that happened in real life in order to be any kind of valid commentary. Okay, here, I specifically wrote down, there's no timeline, but I can't imagine this takes place so far in the future that we are so far removed from racial tension that black slavery and the disproportionate effect of poverty on debt on black people just isn't even mentioned. Like, this future cannot be so far away that this, that it's not even an issue. I just don't believe it. So specifically, I'm linking a blog post from Stitches Media Mix and maybe others if I can find them. I think I did already find another one that I'll link. So if you want to check those out. I rated this officially 3.5 stars, but I'm probably going to lower it to three just because, I mean, it's such a bummer. This was, I've been anticipating this for like six months, but it did not live up to my expectations. All right, four. <laughs> I have less to say about this one. Cool. Heavy Vinyl by Carly Usden and Nina Vacueva. This is volume one of a graphic novel series following Chris, our main character, who gets a job at a record store. It's her dream job. She is super pumped. But it turns out that this record store is a front for an all-girl vigilante group, which is so cool. So Chris gets pulled into this vigilante group when one of the bands that is going to be at the record store, their lead singer disappears, and the group has to investigate her disappearance. Pros for this book, I love the art style. Like the cover is adorable. Let me see if I can find a cool panel. It's just like my ideal art style in a comic. It's just punchy and fun, bright colors, lots about music in here. Um, I love the characters. They're all fun and well-developed. There's a bunch of queer girls. There's a lot about female friendship. There is 
the setting is interesting the mystery was fun it kind of took a weird sci-fi turn at the end that was unexpected but it was definitely fun i ended up giving it four stars i'll definitely read the next one book five was the guinevere deception by kirsten white this is a young adult fantasy retelling of king arthur it follows we start the book following guinevere who is getting married to king arthur at the direction of merlin in order to protect him from some sort of magical threat so pros for this book I like the gender bent retelling aspect. You get that when you meet Lancelot. I liked the magic and the way it was described. There's, and, and like the costs of magic. I don't want to spoil anything, but I thought that was really interesting. And hands down, my favorite character was Lancelot. My cons for this book are that it was pretty slow paced. There was like no action. It was kind of repetitive in the way Guinevere talked to herself. And I pretty much just generally feel like it was fine. <laughs> I have nothing outstanding to say about it, but nothing really bad to say about it either. So I gave it three stars. Oh, I listened to this on audiobook and the narrator was okay again. Book six was Pyre at the Ironholm Trust by Lynn Darrow. This is an adult fantasy novella following Eli, who is, who can, okay. First of all, the setting of this book is like a 20s inspired magical alternate universe. So Eli can do ink magic, which is forbidden magic because it is too easy to modify money or fake contracts, stuff like that. So he illegally works at a jewelry store. And one day at this jewelry store, Duke and his gang of fire magic users break in and steal a bunch of shit. So Eli and Duke get wrapped up together and then end up trying to perform some kind of heist together and there's a romance between the two so first for this book i loved the magic and the way it was described so the way the the actual usage of the magic was described and the uh the descriptions of the physical forms of magic was really cool too i loved the descriptions of the setting it was very immersive you could definitely feel like the art deco and the 20s vibe uh eli is by gender and throughout the book presents both male and female and uses both sets of pronouns the plot was interesting and fun my cons were that duke's character was just not super well fleshed out so i feel like as a result i wasn't really convinced about the chemistry between eli and duke like i didn't really believe it i ended up giving this four stars it was a lot of fun book seven the silent patient by alex mcgladies i don't know how to say this this book follows alicia who was found in her home after her husband was shot to death and the assumption is that Alicia killed him but Alicia has not spoken a word since that happened so however many years later Alicia is it in a psychiatric hospital and this doctor Theo decides he is going to be the one to help her and you sort of follow his investigation as to what happened and his own personal life his relationship with his wife so pros I was really enthralled by the mystery I genuinely had no idea how things were going to end up. And because you're kind of following, you're following two different stories. So you're following Alicia writing down her life in the months up to her husband's murder. She writes in a journal and you're following that timeline as well as the timeline with Theo, the doctor, speaking to Alicia and trying to figure out what happened. And there are like interesting parallels between those two things. There was also a Greek myth. What is the myth? Oh my gosh, of course I can't remember. Euripides. So the Greek myth Euripides, um, that is woven into the story. It's in a really interesting way, in my opinion. I was totally blown away by the twist in the story. It was one of those things where, like, we're getting to the end, and in the last 50 or so pages, you're figuring things out, but it's so wild that you're like, no, that can't be right. That can't be it. And it is. The ship's crazy. Uh, my only cons for this book are that there's fat shaming in here for like no fucking reason. I genuinely don't understand why it was included. The sh I hate that shit. <laughs> um, the character is Alicia's aunt and she's described as fat and Alicia has done a painting of her like it's described as obscenely fat, whatever the fuck that means. And it was just completely unnecessary. Don't understand it. Could have been taken out with no repercussions to the story at all. Oh, also Theo does like some questioning of people in Alicia's life that felt a little cheesy, like like random strangers just telling him personal things about their lives that would never happen in real life. But I ended up getting this four and a half stars. Just be warned of the fat shaming. Just strange. All right, book eight. I'm running out of recording time, so I'm gonna have to do this real quick. What, oh, this is backwards. Servamp by Strike Tanaka. This is a manga, I think, directed for teens. The main character is a teenager. It follows 
Mahiru, who is a, I think he's 14, who just wants to live his life with no adventure and just be chill. But one day he comes across this cat, Kuro, and it turns out this cat is a vampire servant cat. It's a pretty wild story. Uh, my pros are that it was a fun concept. There's like this, these, all the vampires represent the seven deadly sins. So this vampire cat is sloth or laziness. And that's kind of funny <laughs> in all the battles. I ended up giving it three stars. It was a bit repetitive. And there's a character in this book with servants that are all children. Super creepy. I would buy it if I, I would buy the second volume if I could get it for cheap. So my last book, and I have to really rush this, is A Song for a New Day by Sarah Pinsker. This is adult speculative fiction dystopian set in a world disturbingly like ours right now where the government has banned large gatherings of people. Everything is done virtually now. There are concerts and, and interviews and jobs. Everything is done and delivered through drones. So we follow two characters, Luce Cannon, who is a musician, and it follows her before everything was shut down. She wants to, she's a budding musician. She is in the middle of their first national tour organized by their label. Bomb threats are called into every hotel in the entire state, and that is the beginning of the shutdown. We also follow Rosemary Laws, who in the, after everything has been shut down, works for a Walmart-like corporation doing customer service, but she has an opportunity to recruit musicians and she takes it. So she has to venture out into the real world for the first time and in her journey meets Luce. Pros for this book is Sarah Pinsker really, really captures the feeling of live music and the experience of being with other people that are all enjoying the same thing as you. And she does an amazing job at that. Like this whole book is honestly a, a love letter to live music and music performance. There's definitely some themes of uh, fuck capitalism and eat the rich throughout this book. There's a lot of commentary on social media, but it never straight up like condemns social media. It's just a like a cautionary tale. Uh, cons for this book are that I wish there were more interactions between the two characters. It is not a romantic story like I originally thought when I read the description, but it was still interesting to see the interactions between the two characters. Uh, the pacing is a bit off and it kind of drags in the last third. And there's not a lot on like the evolution of how things changed from how they are now in the real world to how everything is handled in the future. This is a much quieter story than I expected. When you read this description, it sounds like it's going to be action-packed uh, sci-fi, but it's really not. But overall, I ended up really enjoying it and I gave it, I forgot to write down what I gave it, four stars, I think. <laughs> All right, let me know if you read any of these or if you read anything awesome in March and want to tell me about it. I post book-related videos every Wednesday, so if you want to see more, subscribe. If you like this video, hit like. If you want to keep talking, you can find me on Twitter or Instagram at Kelsey Reads or Goodreads at Kelsey Lynn Reads. Otherwise, I'll see you next week.